Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and greetings from Pakistan. It is indeed a privilege to have been invited to speak as a panelist at this subplenary, but unfortunately, a last minute logistic glitch has prevented me from joining this panel alongside colleagues that I hold in very high esteem. I'm therefore sending a video clip to ensure that an additional voice from the South is represented on this stellar panel. Let me begin by commending the organizers of this meeting for having dedicated this subplenary very appropriately to a topic of great contemporary relevance. I say this both with reference to global health and in relation to country planning in the health sector. And I say that because as individuals practicing in global health and with a stake in creating normative frameworks that cascade into planning in the developing countries, it is absolutely critical that we show how strategies and streams of planning in primary health care, in health promotion, and in relation to the social determinants of health can converge in common implementation frameworks in resource challenge settings. I also feel that it is absolutely imperative that we demonstrate how each of these public health approaches can actually be synergistic when theory translates into practice and how emergent opportunities can be leveraged to make a case for strengthening state systems within countries. This has to be done in ways that enables the delivery of primary health care and in ways that can ensure mainstreaming health promoting actions whilst addressing the social determinants of health. It is important to appreciate that health related normative approaches may have different historical perspectives when viewed from the lens of global health. The various factions of global health may be seen as, a, as promoting various approaches and speaking different languages. On the other hand, countries may also be diverse in the construct of their body politic, in their system of governance, and in their configuration of their health systems. But as policy makers, managers, practitioners and advocates, we must not lose sight of the need to converge all these diverse global normative considerations into a set of mutually reinforcing actions suited to individual country needs so that they can help to achieve better health and can bring improvements in social conditions. I commend the organizers for laying the need to do this on the table by organizing the subplenary and would like to touch upon three points very briefly in this important thought stream. Firstly, I would like to emphasize upon the distinction between a health system and a health care system. It must be appreciated that health is an intersectoral responsibility and that a number of factors other than performance of health systems are responsible for poor health status of populations within the developing countries. The report of the social, the Commission of the Social Determinants of Health has presented cutting edge evidence relating to inequities of power, money and resources as being one of the strongest determinants of health status of achievement. We all know that per capita income is one of the strongest determinants of health status and that one of the best public health approaches to address child mortality is by increasing the maternal level of education. We also know that as opposed to this, there is very little independent correlation of health status with the number of hospital beds or healthcare provider ratios. In my own country, more than one third of deaths in children are due to diarrheal diseases. Undernutrition is also highly prevalent amongst children. Over the age of 65 years, 14% of rural females suffer from obstructive pulmonary disease which shows that the use of coal and biomass fuel to cook indoors is an important determinant of disease. The public health handles on these issues is not within the remit of the health sector. Similar is the case with the public health levers of tobacco control. Tobacco, as you all know, takes a huge toll on the lives of adults, especially male adults in poor countries. In view of all these considerations, it is important to appreciate that actions in the intersectoral domain are part of health promotion. In fact, 
intersectoral collaboration is one of the key principles of health promotion. Primary health care should in include not just access to curative and preventive care, but should also ensure that everyone deserves to have the basic requirements of health, both health care as well as the underlying determinants of health, which include proper nutrition, adequate sanitation, safe drinking water, safe working in general environments, and safe neighborhoods. I would like to believe that the interests of primary health care, of health promotion, and addressing the social determinants of health automatically converge in this area. The second point I would like to make also has to do with underscoring the importance of interrelationships. I would like in particular to dwell on the subject of human security to make that point. Security is no longer about fighting and weaponry and is no more centered on wars, genocides and human rights abuses. State, economic and human security dimensions are deeply interrelated in today's globalized world. Today, economic warfare can cripple the social fabric of countries and can be devastating for health, social protection and welfare systems. We are all aware that cross-border movement of diseases can be overwhelmingly de detrimental for national as well as human health and control over shared sources of water, which is a critical element in enabling food security, can define sovereignty more accurately than with reference to territorial jurisdictions. Throughout developing countries, the impact of the financial and many commodity crises have created unprecedented stresses for human development with implications for health. Water, energy and environmental insecurity and political and civic instability are recognized as major global risks in many parts of the world. Both of these have a direct bearing on poverty, deprivation and human development. The environmental impact of industrial affluence, municipal wastes, agriculture, agricultural residues and rampant outdoor and indoor pollution in the developing countries play havoc with people's lives. Although these have been the subject of progressive public interest litigation concerning protection of the environment in many and indeed in my country, we are very far from using these as entry points to realizing the right to health in burgeoning populations in most developing countries. It is important to appreciate that the escalating population base poses a threat to demographic security in its own right, because those at the bottom of the pyramid fall prey to exploitation in extremist hands when states fail to provide social welfare, including health, to its people, as has happened in the country that I hail from. There is also the compounding effect of many other factors on human welfare in such environments. In my own and indeed in many other war and conflict-ridden countries, underperforming economies and fiscal pressures due to intensification of wars create unprecedented pressures with dire consequences for human development and health. In my country, for example, more than three times the number of people have died as a result of conflict compared with the total deaths attributable to maternal deaths and deaths due to HIV and AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria combined. These considerations are not just relevant for my country, but 25% of the world's population which lives below the poverty line of less than $1 a day. And for the vast majority of populations which live in conflict-ridden zones, 